So I wanted to give you a sense of what a Victorian widow would look like. I'm cheating a bit. If I was a proper Victorian widow, my veil would go from my knees in the front to my knees in the back, and it would be much heavier than this very light veil, which I can actually see you all. You can't see me, but I can see you. So I will, uh, <laughs> well, I'll start anyway, because really uh, the desire to mourn the dead is a fundamental part of, of um, mankind, of evidence going back to 130,000 years to um, Palestine to show that there were, were mourning customs, mourning rituals, and really they're there for two reasons. They're to help people accept the separation of death and to provide a framework for mourning and dealing with, with death. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is death in the 19th century, why the cult of memory developed. So why Victorian people became really obsessed with this kind of cult of, of memory. Um, Victorian funerals and uh, beliefs, Victorian mourning wear, because I'm always interested in that, and Victorian mourning art. You know all those hair wreaths and, you know, oh, very strange, all kinds of wonderfully strange things that Victorian women did um, in relation to, to mourning art. <laughs> um, anyway, the next screen. Um, death was very much part of life in, in Victorian um, times. You really couldn't avoid it. Every time you took a sip of water, you took a dose of patent medicine, you gave birth to a child, death was hanging around. The lifespan in the first three quarters of the 19th century was short. The average lifespan was 40 to 45 years. So, you know, not very long. Uh, and between 20 to 33% of all children died before the age of 19. They did an analysis of the um, burials in the necropolis in St. James Cemetery, and 40% of the burials were of children under the age of a year. In fact, Victorian parents were told not to get too attached to their children because they'd probably die. And any of you who are genealogists will know when you start doing genealogy, you'll get baby William died, baby William two died, baby William three died, and it would be about baby William IV before you find a baby William who survived. Um, people were killed by epidemics of diseases, typhoid, smallpox, dysentery, scarlet fever, diphtheria, whooping cough, measles, cholera, things we don't worry about now. Consumption. Um, in the mid-19th century, more young people died of consumption out of all the other possible causes of death combined. Uh, Victor Massey, the youngest son of um, Hart Massey, died at 23 of consumption, and the Fred Victor Mission is named after him. There weren't many doctors. Often there was very little they could do, and actually often what they did just made it worse. Um, Bloodletting, not generally a good thing. Um, giving medicines containing mercury, turpentine, morphine, often caused death. Childbirth, um, one, in six women, one in six women died in childbirth. And the average length of the marriage was seven years because women died um, so often. Most men, or many men, had two or three wives. In fact, there was an adage in the 18th century that said, those who marry late protect their fate. Those who early wed make a widower's bed. Mm -hmm. So don't marry early because you'll die in childbirth. Mm -hmm. uh, drugs, lots of drugs to do you in. Uh, children not only die from diseases, but they and from bad doctrine, but they were also killed by their parents who poisoned them accidentally. They would give them soothing tonics. This was particularly a problem in, in England in places like Manchester where there were a lot of working parents. They would go out to work, they would leave their, their children with someone to look after. They didn't want you know, the people to have too much problem dealing with the children. So they would give them a nice soothing medication to keep the child quiet while they were at work. And these would often contain um, laudanum. Uh, and, or some other form of opiate. And what would happen, the children would become drugged, then they would be able to eat, so they would actually starve to death because they wouldn't feed, and it was just described at the time as failure to thrive. What they were really being was slowly poisoned. It was estimated that 30% of the ch infant deaths in Manchester were because of drugs used by working mothers. Uh, children in rural areas actually lived longer and did better because their parents didn't have access to medication, so they didn't end up drugging their children. <laughs> adults, of course, adults were also poisoned by these things. I mean, nothing like, you know, the poor old Victorian woman who felt a little tired, and the doctor would say, well, here, we'll give you this nice reviving tonic containing alcohol and laudanum um, and codeine, and um, 
you know, they feel so much better, not quite too lively, but so much better. And in fact, both Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Florence Nightingale were um, addicted to laudanum um, in their lifetimes to cheer them up. There were all kinds of catastrophes. There was um, the uh, War of 1812, there were the Napoleonic Wars, there were the American Civil War, there were the Crimean Wars. There were accidents, um, trees falling on people clearing land. Um, John Scadding, who was one of the first settlers in Toronto, he was killed when a tree branch fell on him on his land, drowning. Um, there were five little girls who lived out on Ward's Island in Toronto. They went out on, a, on the lake with their brother in a boat. The boat capsized and all five little girls were drowned. Um, children wandering off into the forest, people accidentally shooting themselves or others, house fires, railway accidents, broken limbs that were badly set and resulted in death, infected scrapes, um, horse accidents, anything could do you in. Despair at the harshness of life. I mean, that was often the cause of death um, in Toronto. Um, um, James Wirtz of the German Wirtz Distillery, he drowned himself on, um, in a well in the distillery because his wife had died in childbirth and he was so despondent that he killed himself. Exhaustion. Both men and women are seen listed in the uh, Necropolis um, Cemetery records as died of exhaustion. So life was very hard. But while life, death was very much part of life uh, prior to the 19th century as well, it was really only in the 18th century that the view of death started to change. So earlier the, in the Middle Ages, the whole idea was sort of Expressions of grief were generally subdued with an emphasis on sort of memento mori, remember thou must die. And the images associated with death were skulls and uh, cadavers and hourglasses and so on. Um, death was seen as a skeleton walking around among people, tap you on the shoulder at any time. Uh, early early uh, cemetery uh, markers in, in Nova Scotia and parts of the um, uh, United States will show uh, skulls, often these, next, sorry, next slide, um, winged, winged skulls, um, and the um, epitaphs would read such as, as you are now, so once was I, as I am now, so you must be, prepare for death and follow me. So that was kind of the prevailing, <laughs> somewhat gloomy view. But in the 18th and 19th century, people's views began to change, and images on monuments went from these winged skulls to being winged cherubs and urns and willows. And as I say, in the 19th century, there was a whole cult of memory around death. So one of the things that changed was the Enlightenment and Romanticism. Um, so in the 18th century, with um, the Enlightenment, there came all kinds of classical influences. So people started to get classical education, Napoleon went off to Egypt and brought back all these wonderful pictures of, of um, you know, uh, emperors, um, pharaoh's tombs <coughs> and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the British went on grand tours and they saw all these classical things and they brought these images into their own mourning customs. So suddenly you started to see Etruscan urns, you saw Egyptian obelisks, you saw weeping Grecian mourners appearing. And the Romantic movement in poetry and art brought a whole kind of highly sentimentalized imagery into things. So death was seen now as a gentle sleep, an escape to a better place, the ultimate union with nature, so you get weeping willows and this kind of thing. The death's head, as they say, was replaced by the winged cherub. Um, Boston's Mount Auburn Cemetery, it became the first cemetery which was laid out in a park-like setting. So it's the idea that a cemetery should be someplace beautiful with trees and river around streams and winding roads. And you would come there to walk in the beautiful uh, woods and you know think about death and think about the departed and so on, rather than just sort of um, a cemetery graveyard. Um, cemeteries weren't just for burial, they were really for, for quiet, melancholy, melancholy contemplation. So Gray's Elegy in the Country Churchyard was sort of the, the romantic version of that. Death became an entire aesthetic. Um, the evangelical movement also created a domesticated heaven. So the evangelical idea was that um, the dead looked down on those left behind, and so images appeared of clasped hands, you know, that you would be together again in heaven. Um, there were images of heaven's gates open wide, waiting to welcome you. 
um, epitaphs would read things like, Here cease thy tears, suppress thy fruitless morn. His soul, the immortal part, had upward flown. On wings he soars his rapid way to yon bright regions of eternal day. Uh, the Victorians also had the idea of the good death. So the good death, you had a good death, you had all your family clustered around you. You know, you would look pale and wan and frail because hopefully you had consumption that was considered to be a very attractive disease. Um, you died at home. Presumably you would say something very profound, right? So people would there, you know, you would, you would sort of say you'd seen heaven and you'd say something lovely or you'd um, say something beautiful and flowery. Um, these scenes started to appear in, in books at the time. Beth and Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, that has a very romantic death. Helen Burns and Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. Little Nell and Charles Dickens' Old Curiosity Shop. I mean, these are all very romantic kind of deaths. Uh, my favorite is Oscar Wilde, who on his deathbed looked around at the wallpaper and said, one of us has to go and I think it's going to be me. <laughs> um, I always say that when I die, I'm going to say that the Roman, the Roman emperors believed that when they died, they became gods. And one of the emperors is famous for saying, lo, I seem to be becoming a god. <laughs> Uh, pioneer funerals, they were fairly simple. They involved the community and the friends. There were no undertakers involved. Um, a local woman would, would prepare the body, you know, wrap it in a winding sheet, wash it, put pennies over the eyes. Perhaps that's an old um, Roman idea of putting pennies on the eye, eyes because you had to pay the ferryman across the, the Styx River, so you had to have pennies to, to give to him. <coughs> the coffin um, would be made out of a simple pine box, perhaps stained with a mixture of lamp black and egg white to make it dark. Sometimes they just used a hollow log. So it'd be like a like you dug out canoe. You'd hollow out the bottom and the top of the log and you know stick them together with the body in between. The neighbors would dig the grave, there would be the wake, they would come, um, stay with the body until burial. Um, the coffin would be placed in the living room and everyone would sit around. They'd read the Bible, they'd pray, they'd sing songs, they'd eat and drink. Sometimes they'd drink a lot, um, <laughs> depending. Um, they'd help with the refreshments, they'd help with farm chores. If it, apparently if you died during harvest time, I mean, your, your neighbors would even come and bring your harvest in for you. That was part of what you did. The funeral would take place in the house. Um, it was often led by a lay person, just someone from the village, because unless there happened to be a minister around, a circuit rider passing around, there often wasn't. And then the coffin would be placed on a bier and covered with a, a pall and carried to the grave by a farm wagon by pall bearers. It's all very simple. However, things began to change. So in the urban areas, undertaking began to appear. And this was a product of a couple of things. One was the Industrial Revolution. So with the Industrial Revolution, the middle class only had money to spend on things like morning clothes and a special china and a burial plot and a tombstone and um, morning goods could often be produced quite cheaply too thanks to industrialization so whereas in the old days you'd have to have a painting of, of a loved deceased um, you could have photographs taken you could have cheap zinc tombstones or even if you couldn't afford a big marble tombstone you could have something the Civil War also had a huge impact on the undertaking business because um, it brought forth a need for embalming because you had soldiers who died a long way from home, the family wanted them brought back home, and so embalming became um, important. But the big person, the really big person in the whole mourning field was Queen Victoria. When Albert died in 1861 of typhoid fever, Queen Victoria became the widow of Windsor. She became, for a while she was a virtual recluse, she would see nobody. She uh, said herself that she saw nothing but a pleasureless and dreary life in front of her. Um, she wasn't able to perform public duties. In fact, at one point they thought she would go mad with her grief. She wasn't even capable of attending private duties. She didn't finally resume public life, but she never uh, went out of mourning. She went from full mourning, so all black, to um, half mourning through her white hat that you, you see her, sort of her white hat and, and uh, collar. 
But she was really, people said, if it's good enough for the queen, it's good enough for me. <laughs> you know, um, if she can have, she had bus and, um, next, next screen. There she is, in all her black, she's got a little bit of white. Mm -hmm. And her poor daughter, one of the princesses there, with a bust of Albert. So she had bust, she had portraits, she had a, a post-mortem portrait of, of Albert hung over her bed. She had his clothes and shaving kit laid out every day. I mean, she really did have this, popularized this concept of the, the cult of memory. Uh, mourning became seen as an art, as something dignified, as a gracious etiquette. So, the etiquette was really involved. So, before the funeral, here's our funeral decorating tips for you, okay? <laughs> so first of all, you, have, you now have um, a casket, not a coffin. A coffin was a box, you know, so broader at the top and narrower. A casket was more like a, tre a jewelry box, you know, something you kept something precious in. It would be made out of beautiful wood, shine, it would have all kinds of silver elaborate fittings on the outside, it would have beautiful silk inside. Your house would be draped in crepe, so crepe is a kind of um, a, a form of silk. And you would have crepe hung all around the door, you'd have crepe hung at the windows, white if it was a child who died, black if it was an adult. You had a wreath hung on the door, again with a, a black bow if it was an adult, white if it was a child. Um, your knocker would be wrapped to muffle the sound, and they might put straw down in the street so you wouldn't be bothered by the sound of horses, hooves, and wagons going by. You might want to hire some help. So you might get some mutes who would stand in front of your door. They wouldn't say anything, that's why they were called mutes. They were professional mourners. They would stand there um, with holding a wand with black crepe, again, black was another, but if the child graped over wearing expressions of exaggerated sadness. Um, just to tell everyone. Um, most of the funeral customs developed out of a fear of either that you would be buried alive or that the dead would come back to haunt you. So those were the two sort of things. So one of the things you would do is you would pull all your window curtains and you'd cover all your mirrors or you'd turn them to the wall. And that was, it was believed that um, if the spirit of the departed um, looked into a mirror, they might get trapped in that mirror or if they looked in the, the window, they might get trapped in the house, so you, you wanted to prevent that. You stopped all the clocks in the house so that the hour of the death would never come again. When you started the clock again, you'd start it two minutes ahead. Um, you'd have a wake, and so the wake had two purposes. Part of it was that you stayed awake in case the deceased person came to, um, and also, you know, you, you, um, you stayed awake because you wanted to be with them. So, both of these things. Funeral invitations. Um, in cities and towns by the 19th century, they just put short death notices in the paper. They weren't the sort of long biographical obituaries we see now, but just a notice of the funeral. And the words, friends invited, was sufficient as an invitation. But in small towns, you might not want everyone in town coming to your funeral, right? There were probably a few people you wouldn't want at all at your funeral. I always said if I died at work, I wanted a list of people I wanted to invite to my funeral because I knew there was a bunch of people that wanted to come because it meant they didn't have to work for the afternoon, so I didn't let them come. <laughs> so in smaller places you would send out invitations. It was on a small black edge note paper. Um, and one etiquette book of 1891 warned, do not slight an invitation to a funeral. You can't say no. Um, in early and middle Victorian periods, women did not attend uh, middle and upper class funerals um, because it was felt that women would be able to control their feeling, feelings and there might be a, an embarrassing display of emotion so women were kept away. Uh, the lower classes had fewer constraints on them, they didn't care if they wanted to make a scene. Um, in later Victorian periods, women would go to the funeral but they would not go to the cemetery. The funeral service um, this was often held in the home, and houses were sometimes built with coffin windows. There's a house in Cabbage Town that has a coffin window. So this was a window designed so that you could bring the, the, uh, uh, the casket into the living room without having to worry about going around corners or, you know, through narrow hallways or anything. It would be an extra long window to bring the, the coffin in and out. In fact, um, the house in Cabbage Town the man who owned the house was uh, a manager at Consumers Gas, and he used to actually let people have funerals in his house because of the convenience of his coffin window. 
Um, the, coffin, the coffin would be surrounded by flowers, not just to look pretty, but to appease the spirits of the dead. So it was the idea, you know, Greek and Rome, where you gave gifts to the gods to appease them, you gave gifts to the dead to appease them. They also act as an early form of Febreze, too. Um, <laughs> They would also put ice under the coffin as well sometimes. And the body was always carried out feet first so the spirit couldn't look back at the house. So they felt if it, was, if it looked back at the house, the spirit might take somebody else with them. Um, the procession had a hearse. The hearse was just really a large black um, and glass box on wheels, decorated with silver you know, and, and pulled by black horses. And they would be festooned with black harnesses, silk rosettes, ostrich plumes, black for an adult, white for children, um, lots of crepe. And the coffin inside, again, the casket, actually. Very elaborate. And um, really, you know, you want to put lots of money in because people would see it going by. And it was a form of snobism. You know, the fancier <coughs> the person near the casket, the more important you were. The richer the family, the more ostentatious the funeral. Death is status symbol. Um, if you were a really wealthy family, you might have these mutes in front. You might have feathermen, who were men who walked beside the horses with ostrich feather fans. You might have paid professional mourners. So these were people who were, um, might include wailers. So women who were actually paid to sort of whip up emotion by, by, by crying and, and carrying on, uh, encourage others to do so. That, didn't, that was kind of, not everyone did that. that was, more Irish than it was uh, British. And apparently, I discovered this, you can hire professional mourners today. If you think there are not going to be enough people at your funeral, um, in London it costs 45 pounds an hour to hire a professional mourner. These are generally actors. They read up about you beforehand so that they can mix with your nearest and dearest and, and have a sensible conversation and they have to come up with how they might have known you that would be believable but where they're not going to meet somebody else who says, oh, I worked at that library too, I don't remember that. <laughs> Apparently it's a very challenging job. Uh, my daughter was, my unemployed daughter was looking for things to do and she said, well there was a job. <laughs> um, when Timothy Eaton died in 1900s, his funeral procession up Young Street was three miles long. So, you know, again, an impressive funeral. Paul bearers, well, notes were sent to six or eight immediate friends and family, generally close to the deceased in age, asking them to serve as Paul bearers to carry the coffin to and from the hearse. If the church was close enough, they might carry the coffin all the way. And that's why, even when a horse and carriage were used, they proceeded a walking pace, and that was a, a leftover from the days when the uh, pallbearers would, would carry the coffin the whole way. Um, the family would give the, the pallbearers gloves and colored crepe armbands, and sometimes children served as pallbearers if a friend or sibling died. Um, after the funeral, so after the funeral, we have to invite people back for food. And they actually had special dishes with like morning scenes on them. So you'd have China with weeping willows on it and that kind of urns and that kind of thing. Uh, people also brought food, which we still do, but that was again the idea of, you know, a gift to the dead so that they, to appease the spirit. And sometimes special foods were, were served. For example, in the Pen Pennsylvania Dutch community, they served raisin pie. And that resulted in an idiom that says, someone says there'll be raisin pie yet meaning all hope is lost and death is imminent. So, which is too bad because we eat raisin pie quite often at our house. And so I stopped saying, mm, there'll be raisin pie yet. <laughs> they served round foods. They served round foods because the circle is a symbol of eternity. So they would serve round meat pies and round cakes and round cookies. And they, these cookies were made with um, molasses and caraway and they were stamped with a, a special design, in this case a cross. And then they'd be wrapped in paper and sealed with black sealing wax. And um, you, could, you can't take them home as a memento of the funeral. <laughs> sort of the equivalent of the wedding cake under the pillow, but I don't think you might put this under your pillow. And something I read suggested this probably descended from the idea of sin eating. So sin eating, which is, 
I said sin eating is when I ate both chocolate bunnies at once, but no. Apparently it is sin eating. The idea was that the sins of a dead person were transferred to another person who, for a fee, consumed food and drink handed to them over the coffin. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, unlike other funeral um, events, it, um, food actually became simpler in the Victorian period. It started out far more elaborate with kind of complete meals, and then it became simpler and simpler, but everything else got much more complicated. I think because it reached a point where women were spending so much time worrying about what the hell they were going to wear, they didn't have time to worry about food as well. Mm -hmm. uh, memorial cards and condolence cards. So, ladies and gentlemen, in the morning used black edged cards and stationery for their social correspondence until the period of mourning was over. Um, they also had memorial cards which they would give out. Sometimes they were sent to announce the loss to friends, especially if the circle of acquaintances were, were large, and they would be embossed with traditional symbols of mourning, you know, willows, urns again. And people would keep them as a memento. I have actually settled my grandmother's mourning cards, memorial cards that she had received from members of the family. Um, I said to my daughter, you know, the modern equivalent of um, memorial cards is emails that come with the subject, sad news. <laughs> I got one the other day, it said sad news. I thought, oh my God. And it turned out the sad news was that my ex-husband had lost um, a book that I had lent him. I thought, oh, it wasn't really all that sad news. You know, you scared me. <laughs> uh, calls of condolence. So first calls of condolence would be made by friends within 10 days of the death. Mere acquaintances were not to call until the family had appeared at their place of worship. And when those who were in mourning felt able to receive visits, they would sometimes announce the fact by sending out black-edged cards and closed envelopes to those who had called upon them. But, of course, the Victorian women, the big thing is what you wore. So, because women were really the center of this cult of memory, what they wore, because it's so important, the entire books were written on the subject. So, appropriate mourning dress was seen both as a mark of respect for the deceased and as a way of protecting a woman. So it's kind of interesting because it says it was designed to protect women from the untimely gaiety of a passing stranger. It's a wall, a cell of refuge, an outward sign of inward sorrow. And you can see the advantage of that. It's saying to people, you know, I'm in mourning, so back off in a polite way. So the question is, how long did you wear mourning? Well, that's a very complex question. There were rules, but the limits depend on all kinds of things. They depend on your social status, the historic time period, and their relationship to the deceased. But at one time, if your husband died, you went into mourning for two or three years. If a parent died one year. A child over 10, 6 to 12 months, under 10, 3 to 6 months. A baby, 6 weeks, because get over it. You know, you have to expect your baby would die, so, you know, six weeks is plenty of time. Uh, a sibling, six months to a year. Relatives and in-laws, six months. Some mourning requirements were so strict that they even advised a woman to wear half mourning for three months following the death of her husband's first wife's parents. Some women never wore color again, and some went, I mean, you know, you'd be in mourning for two years, three years, because your husband died, and then your mother died, and you went, mourning for another year and then you know your kid died and you're in for six months and you think okay you had a week when you didn't have to wear mourning and then somebody else died and you were plunged all back in again so it was really it was a major issue um the first stage was called deep mourning um by the 14th century uh, black had really become associated with with the color of grief in western society there was a brief period where white was but it was just very brief um, in the Middle Ages, people would just wear a loose black cloak over their regular clothes. And the reason black was chosen was, was believed that black made you invisible to the spirits of the deceased who might want to harm you. So if you wore a black cloak, they couldn't see you. A Victorian woman in full mourning has been described as a chrysalis of doom, a gloom. And really, I mean, there, there she is, a chrysalis of gloom. Um, you wore unrelieved black and you had the rich mourning fabric, so it had to be a flat, non-reflective material, so cotton, wool, uh, bombazine, which was a dull black fabric made of silk and, crepe, uh, silk, silk and wool combined. Crepe, as we were talking about crepe, this was a very fine 
crimp silk that you wore, and yards of it were fastened around morning dresses with special black pins. And as you went through morning, you could reduce the amount of, um, of uh, crepe you wore. But um, in August 1891, an issue of Ladies Home Journal advised a woman that a woman's a widow's veil should reach to the edge of the skirt, front and back. This is worn so the whole figure is shrouded for three months. After that, it's thrown back, and at the end of another three months, a, sin a single veil reaching to the waist is worn. This m must be worn for six months and then laid aside. And you had to wear this veil, even if you're inside the house, if someone who was not an immediate family member was there, you had to wear this veil. And it was seen by some critics, probably, why is it? It's very unhealthy. Because the veil would rub against your face, making it sore. It was very hard if you had weak eyes or trouble breathing. And uh, the material was full of arsenic. So <laughs> you were happily breathing in this arsenic while you, while you were in mourning. Um, your underwear, even your underwear, had to be black. As the 1890 Gentlewoman's Book of Dress said, if she lifts her skirt from the mud, she must show by her frilled black silk petticoat and plain black stockings her grief has penetrated to her innermost sanctuaries. <laughs> My innermost sanctuaries, I want you to know, not black, but anyway, yes, even your innermost sanctuaries. Jewelry, well really, a lot of people said if you were in full mourning, you shouldn't wear any jewelry at all, but if you did, it should be um, jet or onyx or something black. No trim, no ribbon, you can have a ribbon to tie, tie your hat on, but you couldn't have any lace or feathers. Now, when you went into the next stage, of second stage mourning, sometimes called ordinary mourning, that lasted 12 to 18 months. And now you could wear the white collar or a white cap of cuffs. Um, you could remove a lot of the crepe and just have a simple crepe train or crepe cuff or crepe neckline and hem. You could get rid of your veil and you could wear mourning jewelry, particularly perhaps um, a pin with the loved one's hair in it. Then you're in half mourning or light mourning. That was about 18 to 24 months. So you're into your third year. You lost your crepe by that point, but you would wear purple or gray or mauve. But transition to, transition to color should be gradual. They said it was really bad form. The day after two, two and a half years, you suddenly put on purple. You know, you should to not look too eager to give up mourning. That was true of social life in mourning, too. So there's Scarlett O'Hara dancing in her widow's weave. I mean, so inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Because a woman in mourning was expected to stay home and not receive visitors other than the family or very close friends for six months or a year if she was a widow. If she had to go out, she had to wear her properly draped mourning veil. So you might go and sit in the park, maybe. After a year or two, a widow could gradually and quietly begin to go out. But she shouldn't go to social events for three years. And even then, it was advised that women were not to go out socially the day immediately after the third year anniversary, as they might look anxious. <laughs> I, would, I would think after three years, you might be a bit anxious. <laughs> men, they get off completely, you guys. Morning requirements for men were less restrictive. Um, for example, when a man's wife died, he only had to mourn her passing for six months to a year. Uh, but if he met a suitable replacement in the meantime, he shouldn't hesitate but go ahead and get married because a man needed to be cared for. Uh, women did, in fact, actually women also got married, often wearing full mourning with their first husband because, of course, they needed money. Mm -hmm. And the only way they could get money was to marry money. And so they would often marry perhaps not in full morning, but often in half morning with the white collar and cuffs. Uh, men's dress requirements, they only their best black suit. And give men credit, they were probably wearing black wool suits in August in um, Canada anyway. So they were probably sufficiently uncomfortable. <laughs> they would wear black tie and gloves and a black armband on the left arm. And some um, wealthy widowers might wear a beaver hat with what were known as weepers. Weepers were long crepe streamers that you'd use to to have your manly tears from your, your eyes at, at the funeral. Um, you might have mourning jewelry, so you might have a stick pin, um, or cuffs, or uh, studs, or watch chains and fobs that were made of jet or um, vulcanite, another black stone, or incorporated in the hair of the deceased. And they might carry a, a black-edged handkerchief or scarf. 
or, or have a cane with the loved one's hair in it. Children? So even Victorian children wore black and crepe when they were in mourning for the loss of a parent or a sibling. Queen Victoria wrote that Princess Beatrice, age three, looks lovely in her black silk and crepe dress. Babies could be dressed in white with black ribbon trim. Uh, but some people did object to this thing as sort of just too much gloom. Uh, when my daughter was about a year and a half old, I bought her a black velvet dress for Christmas with a white collar. And my mother was appalled. And she said children should not wear black and unseemly and mournful. Um, so one of the problems was, of course, you had to get this mourning wear. So you, had, you were allowed eight days from the time the person died to be in full mourning. Because, again, you didn't want to look too eager. You know, if you could immediately put on your morning clothes, it suggested you'd already purchased them and had them in waiting, and that suggested a vulgar anticipation of the event. Um, and if you were wealthy, you bought new morning clothes after each death, so you can imagine what that was costing. And women threw out their crepe after each morning period. It was considered that keeping crepe in the house was sort of bad luck. So again, a fast fortune in crepe making was a, a good moneymaker. Now, this, the poor didn't do this. I mean, the poor, and those in isolated rural areas really didn't adhere to these. They couldn't afford the kind of expense, so they made do with maybe homemade morning clothes, whatever cheap black fabric they could get, maybe just a black armband. Um, they might just add crepe to existing clothes, or they might dye their regular clothes black. Um, Parker's cleaners, they actually started as Parker's dyers and cleaners, and that was their chief business, was dyeing uh, clothes black for mourning. But Anyone who's ever dyed anything black, it is a very difficult dye to deal with. It comes off, and there's a story of a woman in full mourning who went to visit a friend on a hot day in Toronto in August and sat on the couch and sweated all the black dye out of her skirt onto the couch. So, and, and some poor women, I mean, they would spend a whole, even poor women, would spend a year's worth of, of money on, on mourning clothes because they wanted to be respectable. So, morning jewelry. Well, there was a lot of debate about whether you should, when you should start wearing morning jewelry and whether you should wear it in deepest morning and so on. So, if you did wear it, it had to be a very dark material, jet, um, though tortoise shell, horn, ivory, iron were, were permissible too. And of course, a lot of it had the locks of hair of the deceased in it. So, jet jewelry, um, jet's a form of fossilized coal. And it was believed, it's, for a long time, it was believed to ward off evil. So it was appropriate to keep that dead spirit at bay, away from you. And it was used in jewelry making for over 4,000 years, but the best jet comes from Yorkshire, in, um, from Whitby in Yorkshire, England. And Queen Victoria popularized it because she said, oh, I would get myself black, you know, jet jewelry, and, and everyone had to have it. Hair jewelry, hair jewelry, very complex. Um, civilizations have long believed that hair somehow holds a sacred quality, retaining something of the essence of the person. Um, I must admit, I have a lock of my daughter's blonde baby hair in my drawer because it's so lovely. And she goes, oh, mommy, that's just creepy. Why don't you make it into a necklace or something? <laughs> <laughs> hair work could be done in various ways. So here you have all of these Victorian women who are sitting around there looking for things to do to amuse themselves. So they loved to do handwork. So they would do the most peculiar things. So one of the things they did was pallet work. And this was very popular in the Georgian times. So you took a piece of porcelain or ivory, and you cut it into the shape, whatever shape you wanted. And you would put a mourning scene on it, either by chopping the hair really, really fine and combining it with an adhesive, and then painting it on the background of the piece. Or you would pound the hair into a powder with mortar and pestle and mix it with distilled water and sepia pigment and then paint it on in fine detail. Oh, wow. Weird. Anyway, or you could do cut work. So cut work is you take all the strands of hair and you lay them out on a glue-covered piece of paper, right? And then you cut, like, shapes out and stick them on. So the word mother there is done with hair that's been glued onto a piece of paper and then cut out and then they've got decorative hair pieces around it. You could do loop work. Loop work um, involved taking, making hair feathers and curls, um, particularly what they call Prince of Wales curls. So that's on, on this side. These are Prince of Wales feathers done in, in, in curls by um, curling a lock of hair around a curling iron two or three times and then placing it over a candle flame to set the hair. 
Um, then you could have braided hair pieces. Now, these were often done by um, jewelers who would do these, these were much more complicated. They were particularly popular in the late Victorian period because they had very large pins, so they were a really good background for this kind of, of woven, um, woven work. But you had earrings, you had bracelets, you had, had uh, uh, um, pretty well anything, you know, uh, watch fobs. And uh, girls, you could, there were articles in magazines, there were instruction kits you could get that would teach you how to do this. And girls would get together and spend Saturday mornings weaving dead people's hair into interesting things. Um, memorial portraits. Okay, well back, I mean, people have had memorial portraits for a long time. Back in the 16th century in Europe, it was really only the wealthy who could afford to have these portraits. By the 18th century, miniatures um, started to be painted posthumously, but showing the deceased as if they were alive became common among the middle class. You didn't know you were going to need this until the person died, so you went rushing out and got the artist to come and paint them, but make them look alive. And this could be carried, put in a frame, or they could be carried as a private memorial memento in a, a bag or a pocket book, or you could wear it as a locket or a bracelet. Um, these were often done by professional artists, but they were also done by genteel ladies who painted them in their parlors. You could have silhouettes. And silhouettes are much easier. These are much cheaper. Um, you could do them one of two ways. You could cut them on black paper, or you could draw the outline in ink and then color the whole thing in with, with sepia ink on um, vellum or paper or glass or whatever. And these could be set in rings or pendants and sometimes a lot of lock of hair. Um, this was sort of the non, the least artistic one. You know, if you weren't much good, you could maybe do this if nothing else. Um, the charm women came, became quite, quite adept at this. Uh, but the things changed when the photograph came along. And in um, 19, 1839, Louis Daguerre in France um, invented the photograph, and then post-mortem post photographs took off. And when I was doing this presentation, my daughter was helping me, and she said, you're not having any of those creepy dead Victorian pictures in there, are you? I said, well, yeah, because that's really a very important part of Victorian, you know, morning customs. She said, well, we have to find the least creepy looking ones. So I found you what I hope are the least creepy looking ones. Let me tell you, there are some really creepy ones out there. Anyway, uh, like the painted uh, miniature, the postmortem photography helped to satisfy the desire to keep the dead alive in memory, but at a cost that most people could afford. So a photograph in 1850 would cost between $3 and $6, whereas a painted miniature between $50 and $250. So, you know, for, for poorer people, this was the one chance. And by the end of the 19th century, when multiple prints could be made from one negative, postmortem photos were printed as sort of carte de visite, so you would mail them to your friends and, and family. Um, my, my mother has several of those, too, saved. Um, a lot of the pictures were of children, and I really understand this because when you took a picture in the Victorian time, you had to sit still for a, quite long, as long as 20 minutes. There's no way you can get a child to sit still for 20, hard enough to get them to sit still for, you know, 10 seconds while you take a picture now. So 20 minutes, parents just couldn't get them to sit still that long. They couldn't afford pictures. So um, when the child was dead, was one way where they would be still. And you knew this was your last chance that you would have to form a memorial. So I find these pictures really, really touching because they are um, grieving parents. And, and they really, when you look at these, if you look at enough of them, um, they really worked hard to try to make it look like the child was alive still. You know, they, they'd show them in their mother's arms or they'd show them propped up with their toys around them. Or they really do their best to make it look like at, at best they're just sleeping. So. Um, Frame memorials. I mean, Victorian women were not just content with painting a miniature or weaving their hair into bracelets. They had to make these incredibly elaborate um, things like decorating memorial tributes and company, all kinds of handiwork, embroidery, painting, wax, um, work, shells, hair, feathers, paper. My favorite, of course, the hair wreaths. There is nothing creepier, I think, than a hair wreath. These are particularly <laughs> popular in America. You would wrap the hair around individual wires, and then you twist the wires into oh, crosses or crowns or wreaths. Um, they weren't often. They weren't necessarily dead. I mean, they did hair wreaths with the the hair of friends and family members, just because they liked to do this. But quite often, it 
involved the dead. Embroidery. I mean, every woman in the 19th century was taught to embroider, so it was a skill that easy, easily lent itself to memorial art. And again, you get all the, the standard death symbolism, crosses, urns, obelisks, funeral flowers, trees, verses from the Bible, um, pious poetry, and sometimes watercolor work for skies or, or faces would be incorporated into the, the, the background. Um, painting lithographs. So, in the early days in the States and in Canada, um, you did get hand-painted pictures, but by, mid, by the mid-1800s, lithographers such as Courier and Ives in Boston began mass-producing memorial scenes. So for the cost of only a few cents, uh, and these would be immediately available to a poor family. So if somebody died, you could go out to the printer the, down the street and have um, a, a, a memorial picture printed. You could choose the number of people you wanted to have. So you could have one, one widow crying, one widow with two children crying, a widower with eight children really crying <laughs> beside his wife's grave. And then you put all the information about the, the obituary information on, on the, the monument and so on. Um, and those were, as I say, very cheap and you could easily produce those. There were also memorial items. One of them was um, casket plates. So casket plates were plates that were put on casket plate, not a coffin plate, because at this point they become caskets. Um, they would be have the name of the, the person inscribed on them and, and the death date and so on, and they were put on the casket and then removed before burial. And they said it was a, time, a hangover from the days when, when actually a lot of coffins would be sort of put in the basement of the church in England, right? You had to be able to identify which was which, but that stopped being an issue when people had individual graves. But they, so they would take the coffin plates off and they would mount them on the wall, perhaps with a hair wreath around them or, or a, you know, a, um, a, shell, a shell wreath. There was special uh, porcelain, so they would make special tea sets. Uh, this tea set, we'll have to see if there's a, a, a willow in the background, it's, it's a morning tea set. Um, and manufacturers of glass and ceramics saw a market and they began to create um, commemorative pieces with typical morning iconography. And one of the things they realized was there was a huge demand for memorial plates for special people. So when Abraham Lincoln died, Prince Albert, there were all kinds of plates, memorial plates made that people would buy and keep in their house. Or there were more generic ones, like there might be a picture of a child, or a statue of a child leaning against a cross, and that you would buy when your child died, and you'd have it in your living room next to the hair wreath. And okay, and ending on my favorite item of all, tear bottles. So this was called a lacrimatory or a tear bottle. And the idea was you saved your tears in the bottle. And when the last tear evaporated, the mourning period was over. And the cigar-shaped one, it was designed to be suitable for men. Oh. So, <laughs> so as I said, for Victorians, it really was a whole cult of mourning. And when you start to read about it, you think some of this is really bizarre. And then the more you read about it, the more you think, but yes, you can understand why they did. Because it helped them transition through this period of grief and it gave them something else to think about while they were moving, moving forward. So there you go. Um, it's a very complex and fascinating issue.